Welcome to the City Impact Church podcast. Join us weekly to listen to sermons from our Sunday services or our special events. For more information, visit cityimpactchurch.com or find us on our Facebook page. We pray you'll be inspired and challenged by this week's message. Romans chapter 13 verse 11. Romans 13 verse 11. Do this knowing the time that is already the hour for you to awaken. Everybody say awaken. Awaken. Touch the person beside you and say wake up. To awaken from sleep. Was that a reality for some? (laughs) For now salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. The night is almost gone and the day, everybody say the day, is near. I hope and pray, uh, City Impact Church of Mount Wellington campus, that everyone here is awake to what is happening in the world today. Um, I don't know whether you read the news or keep up to date with what's happening, but sometimes we need to pinch ourselves and say, wake up, let's stay alert. Because to be honest, the world is getting pretty crazy out there. Uh, having just got back from the States and from Canada and different places. And, you know, it's getting very crazy out there. Uh, but these are the days the Bible does speak about. Does speak about. Let's read Second Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. But realize this, realize this, church, that in the last days, difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, Ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, not a nice list, is it? Brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited. I'm thinking about the fight this afternoon. We've got two conceited guys going in the ring. Just saying. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding a form of godliness although they have denied its power. Father, we pray today that all of us in this place would be awake to the reality of what you're doing on the earth, where we're at, Father, at this time. And we pray that, Father, we would be diligent. Lord Jesus, you said by your endurance we shall be saved. And, Father, we pray that we would be people who would be fully awake to all that you're doing, O God, in the name of Jesus. Amen. So Jesus himself said, lawlessness will abound. And this is not a negative message to say that the world is spiraling downward, but uh, it's a message to encourage Christians to be awake into the hour in which we live. Amen. For those who've got an ear to hear, for those who uh, need this morning a little stir up, a little shake up as it were, because you and I, the Bible says, are not of this world, but we've got to live in the world. Amen. And we need not be ignorant about it, but we're saved out of the world, praise the Lord. And it's not so much, to be honest, what we're saved from, but what we're saved into. We're saved into the kingdom of God. Amen. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. And so my question is, are you living there? Are you living in the kingdom of God? Where are you living? Are you still living in the world or are you living in the kingdom of of God? I just read you a list about the condition of the world. I hope and pray that is not uh, describing any of your lifestyle this morning. And so we can spend our whole life wandering around on this planet, kind of half asleep, living in a wilderness, and yet still go to heaven. You can still go to heaven. But I, I believe we need to wake up, smell the roses like the salt, you know, and the, but make the right choices to live in the promised land. To live in the kingdom of God. You know, when storms come, and uh, I just met a couple here from Texas, and it's not that they flew out to avoid the big storm that's coming, but there was a big storm. I was just in Texas the other week, and there's a massive storm, as you know, just hit uh, the bottom of Texas. And when storms come, it is not so much the storms that take you out, but the lack of foundations, lack of preparation, lack of substance on the inside. And so when you're external world, that which is happening around you, the world that we live in, drives you rather than your internal world. Because the kingdom of God is within you, right? Righteousness, peace, and joy should be within you. There may not be too much around you at your workplace and at your school, 
but it's got to be on the inside. And so when the external world is driving you, you cease to be in control. When circumstances or hurts or disappointments, when you're led by those rather than led by the Word of God, when your own dreams or your nightmares (laughs) drive you rather than being led by the Spirit, you're really asleep. You know people, you know sleepwalkers? Anybody here sleepwalk? Anybody go for a stroll last night? No? I mean, it's a strange habit, I'm just saying. But uh, people talk in their sleep. I know some people snore in their sleep. But, but, but enough to say that, you know, when you're sleepwalking, you're liable to bump into things, right? And uh, we love our cliches, Christians, you know. We kind of quote scriptures uh, glibly. We say, well, don't you know that all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord and I'd have to say to you, no, that's not true. It's not true. Uh, It is true if you follow through on chapter 8. And if you live every day in the Spirit, then all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord. But you just can't go and do what you want to do and expect everything to work out for your good. You can't just pluck a verse and quote that, you've got to read the context of that verse, amen. So we need to be fully awake and walk in the purpose of God and not give the devil a foothold through our own agendas or through sin. Uh, we can't allow the devil to have a, have a sneak, a peek in the door and get a hold of us. See, it's not enough, hear me this morning, just to love God. Sounds good, I love God, but you can love sport but still lose. I mean, I follow the Warriors. (laughs) I mean, I've known people who love their spouse but still go and commit adultery. I've known people who say they love God and they do love God and yet they still mess up. See, my desire in this day, in this age, is that all of us at City Impact Church will be fully awake to the hour in which we live, fully awake to the purposes of God. Matthew chapter 13, verse 24, another parable Jesus put forth to them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tears among the wheat and went his way. You know, this man, he had done a lot of work. He had paid the price. Hello? Done a lot of good things. Plowed his ground. Planned his seed, but then he took a snooze. Snooze, you lose, right? This man took a snooze, and it's amazing how you can be snoozing in life and the enemy can come in. That's why Jesus said to be alert, to be fully awake. The two guys getting in the ring this afternoon, I can guarantee you they'll be alert, fully awake, right? And it's amazing how you can be even awake but asleep to the opportunities that are around you. I mean, we've got community day coming up. How many will snooze through that and not embrace the opportunity that is there? People can be awake but not alert. And sometimes you're awake but so familiar with things we don't hear the squeaking door any longer. You know what I'm talking about? You don't see and hear the things that are happening around you because you just... Live with them. They're normal to you. But the scripture says, be alert for our enemy, the devil, roams around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So I want to be awake. I don't want to live a nightmare. I want to be fully alert. Amen. I think in Luke chapter 16, there's a story, you know it, about the beggar outside the gate of a rich man. The beggar's name was Lazarus. He was covered in sores, and the rich man would walk by him every day. They two, two of them died. One went to heaven, one went to hell. That's the reality of life. This is not about poor people going to heaven and rich people going to hell. A lot of rich people went to heaven. Abraham and David did and so forth. But it's about a person who did not see the opportunity lying at his doorstep. See, this beggar, it comes up on the screen... He was dependent, he was disabled, he lay at the gate, he was diseased, he was full of sores, he was deprived, desiring to be fed, and he was destitute because dogs were licking his sores. The only D in all that list that 
uh, the two men, did it come up on the screen? Yep. The only D that these two men had in common was death. Because death comes to us all, right? As the movie Broken says, are you ready for it when it comes? And so the story, as I said, is about a rich man not being fully awake to the needs around him. This poor man was lying at his door every day and he walked straight past him. See, it doesn't really matter how expensive the wrist watch you've got on your wrist is. We all have the same amount of time. We all have 24 hours in a day. And Michael likes this point because I preached it on the shore just before I went to the States. But you can save time. You can... Sorry, you can't save time. You can't borrow time. You can't loan time. You can't store up time. You can't stop time. You can't steal time. The only thing you can do is make the most of time. The only thing you can do is make the most of your day. Make the most of your life. You can't get any more time than President Trump's got or, or anybody's got, right? We've all got 24 hours in the day. And so you can make the most of your time. And as I said, the only D that was the equalizer in life is death. It comes to us all. And so before that D comes, are we going to make the most of our life? Are we going to see the opportunities that I believe are around us every day? Or are we going to be asleep to them? Like the community day, are we going to let it go by? Or are we going to be fully alert and embrace those opportunities? Amen. I don't know about you, but... I don't want to die before my time. So we've got to be awake to what is happening. Jesus said to the Pharisees, there is none so blind as those who cannot see. In other words, they were awake but asleep at the same time. Isn't it true you hear sports commentators while the team is playing and they say, oh, they've gone to sleep. What, what they all do, take a nap on the field? No, they just zoned out. Just not fully alert. They went off the boil, whatever description you want to make of them, but they got distracted. Maybe they got despondent, disjointed, disconnected, or disheartened. But people are like that in church. They might come to church and go through the motion, but they're not really connected. It's easy to sleep while the greatest opportunities are around. I mean, Eddie was talking about the disciples this morning and I mentioned a, a couple of points when I jumped up, but it's true, you know, in Luke chapter 9, verse 32, Jesus goes up to the mount, the Mount of Transfiguration. Unbelievable experience, right? I mean, here he was with Elijah and with Moses. I mean, it's just an incredible experience. And guess what? The disciples are sleeping. <laughs> I mean, Peter, James, and John, they took a nap. Miss the opportunity, right? It says in verse 32, but Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep. But when they were fully awake, they saw his glory. You know, one of the greatest moments on earth, and they slept through it. But I mentioned this morning as I jumped up after Eddie, and it's so true that, that um, Judas, as you know, he was the one who portrayed Jesus. He's always mentioned as Judas, one of the twelve. And the disciples, the other 12, of course, some of them wrote the Gospels. It's like they wanted to identify because they knew that they too had betrayed Jesus at the cross. They all <laughs> stood afar off. And the only other disciple that was said to be one of the 12 was Thomas at the time of his denial of Christ. It says Thomas, one of the 12. In other words, they all again identified with, with having doubt and so here's the disciples sleeping during this time and if it can happen to them it can happen to you and I hello well let's look in Luke chapter 22 verse 32 because this wasn't the only time it happened to the disciples not the person beside you and say stay awake this morning You know, I don't know about Pastor Trevor. He just got back from Canada. I don't know whether he takes sleeping pills or not, but I, I don't take sleeping pills. I don't sleep on airplanes I, because I just find it difficult. It's noisy and people walking around and, and so forth. But, you know, a lot of people take sleeping pills to, 
to 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 sleep. But I don't like sleeping pills because it does, you know it's like I'm not in control. You know, <laughs> I don't know what it is, but you know. But uh, any case, so I hope you haven't taken one this morning in church. But Luke chapter 22, here's another great time, great need of Jesus. He's in the garden just before his betrayal, right? And he's praying. And again, he takes three of these disciples. And it says in verse 37, he came to his disciples and he found them sleeping. (laughs) Well, if it can happen to them, it can happen to us. Now, they were literally sleeping. I mean, to be honest, I'm looking around. I don't see anybody sleeping literally this morning. I have had people sleep in church. It really bugs me. I mean, when I see somebody sleeping, I, 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 I slap the pulp or something, you know, and try to wake them up. But I've had people, I've done everything and they haven't woken up. I won't tell you who they are either, but they've got a lot better as they've got older. I don't know what it was. But, but... Enough to say that these disciples were literally sleeping. I'm not necessarily talking about literally sleeping. That's, that's worse. <laughs> you're not aware of anything going around you when you're sleeping, right? But I'm just talking about being awake and yet zoning out, going off the boil, not being alert, right? That's what I'm talking about. And Jesus went and prayed again the second time, came back, they were still sleeping. So, again, I don't want to point the fingers at the disciples. I'm just saying, hey, if it can happen to them, it can happen to me. I've got to learn from this, right? I mean, if you point your finger at the disciples, you've got to come when it comes time for you. Like Peter, he said, I'm not worthy to be crucified up the same way as my Lord. I'm going to get crucified upside down and and all that kind of stuff. So if you're going to point the finger, you've got to go the whole hog, right? So it doesn't pay to point the finger. So in any case... It says there in verse 41, he came a third time and said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? It is enough. The hour has come. Amazing. Must have had a tough life. I don't know. But here they were sleeping at Christ's greatest need. But it's easy to sleep. It doesn't take a lot of effort. Anybody going to have a nana nap this afternoon? I'm going to watch the All Blacks and... Then I'm going to watch a match. Then I'll go to church. I'll be, I'll be right on it. Hallelujah. Some of you are looking at me as if I'm backsliding. I've got to be aware of what's going on in the world. Just saying. But it's not, it doesn't take a lot of effort to go to sleep. You just lie down, you know. And I know some people have trouble with sleeping, but I never had had that problem. Not at the right time, but never been one to sleep during the day. But people can sleep through the greatest times of importance. People have slept in and missed a flight. Think about that. I've known people who have slept in and missed a flight. I've known people who have slept in and been late for work. (laughs) I've known people who have slept through a harvest. Jesus said, look up, look up and rejoice. Look up. Don't look down. Don't go to sleep. But look up. The fields are white under harvest. Amen. I mean, I was seeing something on television just recently, and they got all these security cameras. As you know, it's the world is like Big Brother's watching and, and all that kind of stuff. And there's so many security cameras now, and they're installing more around the place. And in any case, but the problem is now with all these security cameras that are normally up on poles, everybody's walking around like these guys in the front row, walking, walking along with their heads down with their devices on, because they're taking notes, both of them. But, but enough to say that everybody's looking at their devices. And they got their heads down, right? And so the cameras aren't picking them up. But, but the thing is, is that even walking around with your devices, you know you're not fully alert of what's happening. There's been people who have been knocked over by cars and killed by looking at your device when you're walking around. You know that to be true, right? And so the rich man, even though he was awake, he was going out his front door every day, he was asleep to the poor man. He is asleep to the opportunities, asleep to the harvest. Every time we should be looking at the opportunity to getting a... I mean, I, I mean every time I, when I'm talking with people, I'm looking for an angle. Yeah. Whether it's a taxi driver, whether it's a, a waitress, I was 
uh, sewing a young girl. I think I mentioned her last week over the summer car. She had a tattoo on her arm and it says, everything bad happens, something good comes out of it. So I was able to talk to her about the bad being the devil and the good being God. You know, you've got to look for an angle, amen. You've got to be alert. A lot of people wouldn't even seen the tattoo. I said, that's an interesting tattoo. You've got to be awake to opportunities, amen. And he wasn't awake to the harvest, to the opportunity right outside his front door. He was not aware of his own spiritual state. Are you aware of your spiritual state? Are you awake to that? The reality is, and a lot of people don't want to know, is we all die. And when we die, we either go to heaven or hell, depending on whether we've accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior. Right? Many religious leaders, but there's only one Savior. And so we've got to be awake to that. Let's have a look in Genesis 28, verse 10. Are you getting anything out of this today? Genesis 28, verse 10. Jacob is on the run, and and he comes to this place, and he takes a stone, puts it under his head as a pillow. Now, you think your pillow is pretty hard. You know, when you're young, you can kind of sleep anywhere, right? I mean, when I was young, I was sleeping in a car. I used to lay down on the footpath and go to sleep, you know, after a party or whatever. But, you know, you just sleep anywhere, right? You know, I was a bit crazy. I used to sleep in the middle of the road and all that. You know, you do stupid things when you're unsafe. And, um, and so I've known what it's like to have concrete as a pillow. But, um, you know, as you get older... Hands up those who like the comforts of home a little bit more. Corey's got his hand up. Do you know my wife travels the world with her own pillow? It squashes down to nothing. It's very soft, but, you know. In fact, I remember when we walked the heffy track, she carried her own pillow. Well, actually, I had to carry it for her. Just saying. It wasn't the heffy. I, I walked the heffy. It was actually the root burn. That's right. She didn't come on the heavy timbers, just the boys, wasn't it? It was a boys' trip. Hallelujah. I won't tell you what Tim did. At least he didn't have to be airlifted out like others. Although they came close. Any case, let's, let's carry on. Let me just say that Tim's a leader. He likes to be out in front by himself. Forget about everybody else. (laughs) And I'm normally there as well, but because I was a pastor and I had to bring up the the rear, make sure everybody got there. Somebody had to look after the crew. It says in verse 14, your descendants will be dust of the earth, you'll still spread abroad to the west, west, the east and the north and the south and I was glad to hear Eddie mention that this morning. As the scripture says, I believe, therefore I spoke. Verse 16. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely, Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely, Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely, the Lord is in this place. And I didn't know it. Wasn't aware of it. And how? And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is a gate of heaven. Then Jacob arose early in the morning. He took the stone that uh, put his head and set it up as a pillar. Now, if you don't know the story, here's Jacob on the run. And Jacob was one who was running continually in life. He thought he could outrun his family. He thought he could outrun his circumstances. He thought he could outrun God. Later in Scripture, you even see him fighting with God. Amazing how many people want to fight with God. They don't want to surrender to God. They think they can fight with God and win. And yet we read that it was when he stopped running just for a moment that God spoke to him. God gave him a dream. See, no matter where you run to, friend, God is already there. Hallelujah. You can't outrun him. God is in that place. You know, a change of location will never, ever fix your problems because you take yourself there. And so he comes to a special place and he says, surely this is none other than the house of God. I didn't know it. A lot of people don't recognize that about the church. The Bible has ordained that Jesus said, I will build my church. This is the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. A lot of people aren't aware of it. But if you're awake, if you're alert, you are. And this was a place to be esteemed, a place that was special. 
But it's easy to treat the house of God lightly and disdain because you're not fully alert. The house of God, the gate of heaven, because to be saved is to be added to the church. And I've seen many people, many people over the past 35 years just walk right out of the will of God. But they say to me, Pastor, you didn't see what that person did to me. It's true because I wasn't looking. I like what Pastor Mark Ramsey said, but the church hurt me. And he says, your point is, <laughs> did the roof fall in on you? The thing is, it's not what someone did to you. It's not that the, the church hurt you. It's that you got hurt. It's what you did with it. If you allow it to take hold of you, if you internalize it, and it will fester inside of you and it will poison you. We all get hurt. I believe it should be like water off a duck's back. Soft heart, but thick skin. Covered with the blood of Jesus. Because if you walk out, you've just lost the battle. You have to look above. You've got to look to Jesus. With every hurt and disappointment, you've got to look up to Him. Get your eyes off circumstances. Get your eyes off people and look to Him. Amen. You've got to be in faith. If you try to figure it out up here, it'll take you out every time. But the heaven's blessings were open to Jacob in that place. So he never want to leave the place. Amen. So he took the stone that he slept on and set it up as a pillar. And his pillow became a pillar. You know, there are some things we need to turn around because we're heading in the wrong direction. Some things, when they get too hard for us, We need to be altar builders. When things get too hard, get too tough, when disappointments come, heartaches come, build an altar. Altar a prayer, altar a worship, an altar a giving, an altar a sacrifice. I mean, Abraham was an altar builder. He built five altars. I remember what Sarah Bowling said and of course, uh, his son Isaac didn't have a good experience with altars. He was the one up the mountain, you know, that Abraham was about to put on the altar. And he only built one altar because he knew God as Jehovah Jireh, his provider. But Jacob, his grandson, he was an altar builder. And Jacob took this stone and set up this altar. So there are many Christians that are saved, but not living in the promised land because I believe they're not awake, fully alert. The devil comes like a prying lion, they're not alert to his, his devices, they're not alert to the opportunities that are around them, they're not alert to the harvest that's around them. Walking around people that we can reach. You know, I think about sport, because I, I, I do enjoy sport. I think about work, I enjoy work. I think about housing, I, I like housing. I think about, you know, all these things and holidays and I need more holidays. <laughs> but I want people, I want you, listen now, to be the very best you can at sport, to be the very best you can at business, to have the greatest holidays, to have wonderful time, but not at the expense of your soul. And this is what happens today. People go down a path and be at sport because Sundays and all that kind of stuff. And, and it takes them out of the house of God. It takes them away from the things of God. They don't think it will, but they start to doze off to the purposes of God. They start to fall asleep to the importance of altar building every Sunday in the house of God. And so even though I want people to have the best life they can, but not at the expense of their soul, right? And so I have to be honest... Uh, Spiritual war goes on every day. So it's like Mayweather and Conor McGregor getting in the ring this afternoon. They said, they'll, they'll be awake. They'll be fully alert. But we're in a ring 24-7. <laughs> the devil's walking around like a roaring lion. And so, you know, the battle is heating up in these last days. As you know, I ride a Harley and Peter's down. He knows what it's like and... Just had a great ride around the Cabot Trail over there, Peter, one of the great rides, and, and through, the, through the Rockies as well, met up with the key season. Between Sunday's preaching, I took a bit of time. I need to at my age. And in any case, so, so we're riding, and, and uh, you know the old saying is, what do you do when you're on a motorbike and you're in a corner 
and you're going too fast. Of course, the cliche is it's too late. <laughs> You've got to slow down before the corner, right? And, and it's like that a lot of the time in life. It's too late. I've met parents who stop bringing their kids to church because sport maybe hurts, maybe whatever, and they stop bringing their kids to church and you know, because uh, it's no longer their habit. And then the kid becomes a teenager and now the teenager doesn't want to go <laughs> to church because they've got involved with other friends and maybe other lifestyle patterns and the parents come to the pastor, can you help me with your teenager, with my teenager? Guess what? Too late. <laughs> You're already in the corner, my friend. Seek first the kingdom and all these things will be added unto you. You don't just glance at the kingdom. You don't just occasionally look at the kingdom. You don't just once a month I'll, I'll pop along, you know, if it suits me. No, seek the kingdom. This is the way that you are awake, amen, that you're fully alert. Seek the kingdom. See, it's the glory of God to conceal a matter and it's the glory of a king to dig it out. Pursuit is the only evidence of love. When you love a girl, you pursue her, right, guys? Michael said, yep. You got something in mind, Michael? He's growing his hair because he figured the bald head didn't win anybody. So, so he put some hair on his head because he figures he's better looking. But pursuit is the only evidence of love. And today is so true. Listen, as I bring this to a close, we are bombarded basically with hell out there in the world. When I drive home today, there'll be billboards. <laughs> When, when, I, when I watch the All Blacks, there'll be ads, whatever, on, on television, right? I call it television sometimes. I mean, there's all newspapers. I read the newspaper. I mean, I was looking at an article just yesterday, and I, and I, I was wanting to show Bev, and I screened down, and all of a sudden there's all these expletives. I mean, you know, it just bombards you, doesn't it, at school? Do you know I heard that there's 15,000 Teenagers under 16 in New Zealand on antidepressants. 16,000 New Zealanders under the age, 15,000, sorry, 15,000 under the age of 16 on antidepressants. What's wrong? There is something wrong with that picture. You know, when I, I just have to say, but you know, when I grew up, nobody was on antidepressants. We didn't have time to be depressed. I mean, we had to do chores. <laughs> We had to milk the cows and put the trash out and, you know, and sweep the yard. I mean, I'm just saying, you know, it's true. We played sport and, you know, swam and, you know, did, did things, built huts, tree huts. And I know a lot of kids living in apartments don't have those opportunities. But, but I'm just saying that, you know, if you get your kids on all these devices, they're going to get depressed, all right, depress me. People are bombarded and the devil wants to tempt you to sin. And so if he can get you to doze off, if he can get you to not be fully alert, he'll discourage you. He'll discourage you because he wants you to have feelings of inadequacy. He wants you to have feelings of anger, of jealousy, of envy, of discontented. He'll create those opportunities for you. And so you become disconnected. He'll try to get you to listen to gossip. That's what a lot of Facebook is, except my page. <laughs> and he bombards you with evil. But the answer is simple. Here's the answer as I bring this to a close. Listen. You've got to be bombarded with good. Yeah. It's like the black dog and the white dog, the old man who used to fight his two dogs. And he always put his money on the one that won. And, and he was asked, how do you know which dog is going to win? He said, the one I feed the most. And so within you, there's the old man and the new man. Which one are you going to feed the most? What are you going to watch the most of? Are you going to read the Word of God most or are you going to read the news most? And so you've got to be bombarded with the kingdom of light. Not bombarded by the kingdom of darkness. Because the world is out there. You and I live in the world, but we're not of the world. Amen. We've been saved out of the world. We've been saved into the kingdom of God. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. So we've got to be bombarded with the Word of God. We've got to be bombarded with church. The more time you spend in church, the better off you'll be. You've got to be bombarded with prayer. 
Got to bombard yourself. You want to grow? Bombard yourself. Bombard yourself by doing good. Bombard yourself by serving. See, the devil would try to tell you that you'll be happy if you get blessed. It's not true. Psychiatrists will tell you. Psychologists will tell you. The Bible will tell you that it's more blessed to give than to receive. So when you come on a community day, I know I'm giving it a little plug here, but you're going to get blessed. And so you get bombarded. Get bombarded by giving. The devil say, no, keep your money to yourself. You'll never get blessed that way. So Jacob was not aware, not awake to the fact that he had nothing to run from because he was blessed right from the beginning. I close with Ephesians 5 and Joel chapter 3, but just the latter part of Ephesians 5, we could read from verse 6. See, you get anything out of this today? Just trying to help you in life to have a happier life, a healthier life. Ephesians 5, verse 14. For this reason, well, if you look at verse 11, do not participate in unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead expose them. I mean, we could talk about the whole passage here, but verse 14. For this reason, it says, awake sleeper. Awake sleeper. Everybody say, awake sleeper. And arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. In Joel chapter 3, one of the Old Testament wonderful passages, in verse 9 it says, Proclaim this among the nations. Prepare a war. Wake up the mighty man. That's what I'm endeavoring to do this morning because you are all mighty men and women all in one here. And it goes on down to verse 14. I like, like verse 10. Let the weak say I'm a mighty man. Say I'm a mighty man. <laughs> Turn to the person beside you and say you are a mighty man. It's not being sexist. It's... Verse 14, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day, the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. I hope and pray this morning, friend, that I would encourage you to live life alert, live life awake to the opportunities that are around you. Don't doze off. And allow the devil to get a foothold. It's so easy. I've known what it's like. You know, you just let the guard down, let the defenses down. Next thing you know, there's, there's someone knocking on your door. You've got to be fully awake and fully alert to what's happening around you. Because even though you're in the world, you're not of the world. The kingdom of God is within you. So let righteousness, peace, and joy prevail. And you need to bombard yourself with the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of darkness.